right, let's get started. So uh, this week we'll take a break from the, or today we'll take a break from the technical topics and talk about the history of photography uh, again and uh, talk about composition. But, and then we'll return to the technological subjects on uh, Thursday, on Wednesday. We'll talk about autofocus and exposure metering. And then there'll be quite a, a run of technical stuff before we do our next history. All right. But before we begin, the people who've submitted photographs may not know it, but what I like to do is to go through the photographs that were submitted for those who chose to do the assignments and pick a few of my favorites and show them to everyone. So uh, since the community is public within the course anyway, I figured this is all right. Uh, so here are uh, a few of my favorites. Uh, Vladimir Kaisenko, Bad Exposure. Actually, I would call that almost a perfect exposure, but it's definitely an underexposure that's deliberate and I think sets the mood very nicely for this scene. Uh, this by Alice Liu. Um, so, I don't know, is Alice here? She, oh, she is, she's in the back. Uh, I think this is a great use of underexposure. Just a really masterful picture. Uh, Lauren Nori, uh, nothing in focus. Is Lauren here? Nope. Okay. Well, we've got a large external audience, so might not be worth asking whether people are here. Um, yeah. So you can see the bokeh, the lovely bokeh of this lens everywhere. Zalman Stern, uh, what he calls a bus going to light speed. <laughs> the caption makes it. <laughs> It's a great photograph, too, but the caption really, yeah. The dream of the Google commuter. Oh, that's right. That was an audience comment. I didn't say that. <laughs> oh, bus going to light speed. Uh, all right. Uh, Samir Ansari, the wrong white balance. So making very, very blue flames. And Ian Fisher, another wrong white balance. Now, I don't know. Is this a photograph? It's a GIF. It kind of qualifies. Let me do that again. Let me do that again. There's multiple photographs. And really uh, has a kind of sets you off on edge a little bit to have a white balance like that. And uh, uh, Ellie Patton, poorly composed or very kind of off composition, definitely makes you immediately think, whoa, why did they compose it like this? Which is by itself interesting. And end with this one by Florian Kind. So. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it? It's actually not a person. It's a sculpture he made in the sand. And I think those are marbles for the eyes. If you Google, if you search for it in the community, and you, there's a much longer description that he has of how he's done these things. Uh, Florian's not here, is he? Yeah, he is in the back. Uh, okay. So, with that, let's switch. So we don't need to look at that picture anymore. <laughs> and let's talk about uh, history. So we'll go through the history in stages and what happened after the initial age of daguerreotypes and portraiture as photography began to become a little bit more practical and therefore a little bit more portable is people started documenting the world and taking it out to places and bringing those images back because if photography was not as ubiquitous as it is now, painting was the only mechanism to show people what another place looked like. And this was a new and very powerful mechanism for doing that. So uh, we'll go through a number of different kind of uh, eras here. So what we're not talking about is photography as an art form. It has a nice history that begins somewhere sort of in the middle of this. And we'll cover that the next in the next, next history installment. OK. so. Everyday scenes. It is the stuff that paintings are made of as well, but this happens to be a photograph. And to be fair to Talbot, who got the short end of the stick on the daguerreotype uh, paper um, controversy, this is a paper print, and it's a uh, calotype. So it has the, the whole paper process with the hypo, and then it makes a negative, and then you make a copy from it. And by 1846, it was making fairly good prints. And so this could be brought back to England and show people what this part of Italy looked like. 
So the idea of depicting everyday scenes was, of course, current in art at the time. And so I can put alongside a lot of these photographs, paintings from the same time, uh, this one by Corot. It has an everyday scene in it. It has an informal arrangement of elements in it. So some of the same uh, feel and composition as the photograph on the left. And the photograph on the left really almost looks like a painting, actually, the way he's chosen the composition. So, of course, the grand tour of Europe, <coughs> excuse me, especially for the English-speaking peoples, was something that, that uh, was popular in the 19th century. And so postcards of other places are an important part of that. So what is this place? What's that? Athens. Athens, the Parthenon, yeah, which was uh, uh, destroyed, partially destroyed in 1687 by bombardment by the Venetians because the Ottomans were storing gunpowder in the Parthenon. Not as clean as it is today. Uh, okay, uh, what's this place? Notre Dame. Famous gargoyle. Actually, it's not a gargoyle. A gargoyle, I, I looked it up, gargoyles have to actually be water spouts. So it's just called a chimera or a chimera. A gro or a grotesque sometimes it's called. And it's still there. It's a picture I took. It was added, it, it's not original from the Middle Ages, it was added during Wally Le Duc's uh, restoration in the 19th century. How about this place? What's this? This is a hard one. Oh, wow, very good. Crystal Palace, that's right. Um, so arguably the first large-scale glass and steel building. Uh, iron, I think, actually. I'm not, I'm not sure about that. Um, moved once and then burnt eventually, so it doesn't exist anymore. Very large-scale building, and it was used for, uh, for uh, an exposition, the Great Exhibition of 1851. Uh, no, this is a really hard one. No one's going to get this. This is the Great Eastern, the largest ship ever built by a factor of six at the time, built to carry uh, migrants uh, from Europe to America. And it's uh, very odd because it has propeller and paddle wheel and sail because they just didn't quite trust these steam engine thingies yet. Uh, this launching with this winch actually failed. They needed a bigger winch. It's uh, a famous ship in the... Uh, in American history also because it was used to lay the first transatlantic cable because it could hold that giant spool of that cable. The one, the one that Whitehead destroyed? The one that Whitehead destroyed. Oh, I don't know that story. Uh, okay. I'll look it up later. Uh, and there is Isambard Brunel, the builder of the Great Eastern, standing in front of that same winch. Uh, okay, um, so notable events could also be the subject of photography. It's kind of halfway to photojournalism. And so around the middle of the 19th century, uh, photographers would begin to uh, record those. This one everyone should know. Railroad Promontory, Utah. And uh, so, of course, this is a slide I showed in my class at Stanford, and I expect everyone to know that, because that is Leyland Stanford. And the golden spike is in the museum at Stanford. There's actually two of them. One is also in the Smithsonian. So you know that that actually is completely changed, has nothing to do with the museum in the afternoon. There was no steel in there. Oh, no, of course not, because uh, it would be stolen right away. And besides, gold is a very soft metal. I'm talking about the actual railroad. That was, it did not come together the way they were Yeah. Uh, uh, right, he's pointing out that it didn't come together. Uh, they actually went past each other because they were being paid by the mile. And so it was two separate companies and they couldn't agree, so they just kept going past each other because they were being paid by the mile. And there was this final negotiation that said, all right, let's stop this silliness and tear up some of this track. It's a great story. It's a great story. Uh, okay, so arguably the first example of real photojournalism. Can anyone guess what this is? Yeah. 
That's right. That's right. So this is perhaps the uh, more obvious, the execution of the co-conspirators of the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. And so there was a photographer here just taking a picture of this to record for posterity. Uh, John Wilkes Booth, Booth, the assassin on the right. Okay, so one of the technologies that's being developed in the middle of the 19th century that's really allowing photojournalism is wet plate colloidian uh, photography. So it's a really messy process. Um, let's see, clean the glass plate, flow it with uh, iodide bromide, then put on the silver nitrate, which is the photosensitive material, then expose the plate, and that has to be done very soon after the nitrate bath, and then develop it, and then fix it. And so these are glass plates, so they're heavy, and this has to be done all fairly soon. Also uh, seems very toxic. The, uh, the uh, collodion is a nitrocellulose um, formulation, so it's also flammable. So this is a really, it's a dangerous and a toxic process. But any number of prints can be made. The resolution was high. Um, and so you needed a traveling darkroom. And this would be a typical wet plate process. Um, and it could be taken into the field if you were willing to take all that stuff packed on a mule or something like that. So perhaps the most famous example of this is Matthew Brady, who was the preeminent photographer of the Civil War. And he didn't take all the pictures himself, as you'll see in a moment. He had a, a whole staff of photographers, but he took a lot of these pictures. So these are all going to be posed carefully because the exposures are long. Um, this is a four-second exposure. You can see the tree blowing in the wind. It's actually a good time to show this because I think it's the next week should be the um, hundred. And, it's April twelfth would be the hundred and fifty seventh, I think, anniversary of the start of the Civil War. Camp life, artillery. So again, all carefully posed pictures. Note the flag flapping in the wind. Again, it's a long exposure, and they had to stop whatever they were doing in this training exercise uh, in order to appear in the picture. Who's the tall guy? <laughs> Abraham Lincoln. He was six foot four without his stovepipe hat. Uh, this is an, uh, Antietam. So Antietam has a fairly um, vile reputation. It is the deadliest battle in American history. 23,000 casualties, which is an almost inconceivable number given the, the wars that have happened in the last half century. Even relative to World War II, more people died in the Civil War than died, in, uh, and more Americans died in the Civil War than died in World War II. It was an extremely bloody war. This photograph was probably posed uh, in the sense that they dragged some bodies together to make it a bit more dramatic. And the picture was taken by one of uh, Matthew Brady's staff photographers. It was a very brutal war. Uh, they had plenty of nasty artillery even in the middle of the 19th century. And this is what was left of Richmond after a month of bombardment by Union artillery. Last picture from the Civil War. So if you remember your uh, uh, high school history, uh, Sherman's march to the sea. Uh, he marched uh, all the way across the Deep South, destroying everything in his path. Um, he doesn't look very googly, does he? <laughs> <laughs> Not someone I would want to have coffee with. All right, let's uh, switch to a more uplifting topic. So photography played an important role in the surveying of the West, which then became an advertisement to bring people out to the West in the uh, middle and uh, end of the last century, uh, the 19th century. So the Hayden Survey was part of that uh, in 1870. So they went around uh, making topographic maps of the Rockies and the Sierras. There are, um, there are a lot of mountains that they named, so named after each one of the people in these photographs. Uh, note the chuck wagon on the right. That's their food. Their micro kitchen there. <laughs> and so this is an example of one of the very detailed maps that they made uh, during their survey. This looks kind of familiar. <laughs> hmm. 
<laughs> yes. At least so far as I could tell. <clears throat> Didn't have the roads that I biked on. Okay, so one of the things that was happening in the 19th century in the United States was landscape tourism. So the background there is we were jealous of the Alps and other things of Europe, and so we were looking for beautiful things in the United States. So the artists would somewhat exaggerate them, of course. Um, we were a Protestant country, primarily, and so we would uh, like to make pictures of everyday things um, rather than saints exclusively. And then those would become advertisements for travel. And uh, this is an example of that. It's from the Hudson River School of Painting uh, in the 1830s, and Thomas Cole was perhaps the most famous of those painters. This is actually not that exaggerated. It's a little bit exaggerated. Crawford Notch, of course, has a road through it now. But it looks sort of like that. Um, so I apologize for the, uh, the break. This is an open plate of a, from a book. So this is Bierstadt's Rocky Mountains. So do you think this looks uh, realistic? No, it looks like we're still jealous of the Alps. <laughs> That's not uh, any Rocky Mountains that I know about. This is a huge painting. I think it was something like 9 feet by 12 feet. It was displayed in New York to enormous crowds for weeks and then sold for the most that had ever been paid for a painting. It was $25,000 at the time. And so it was used to tell people about what other places looked like. So this is 1863. It's pretty early in the age of photography. Soon enough, you couldn't exaggerate this much because photography came in and said, well, this is actually what the West looks like. It doesn't look like Bierstadt's paintings. And gradually then you found artists taking the cue from the photographs and saying, all right, how are we going to draw this stuff? Um, because it doesn't look like Bierstadt's paintings. And they began gradually to develop a palette and a style of drawing that was not the same as the photographs, but a little bit more true and uh, specialized for the region, inspired by the fact that they could no longer exaggerate quite so much because of photography. And it's also a very beautiful drawing by William Holmes. It's still exaggerated. The canyon is deeper and narrower than it really is, but um, I think there's some figures that you can see in the lower left there. Uh, but it's beginning to truly reflect the American West. So here's a story that's partway between those two. Uh, this is the uh, Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone. This is a photograph. So let me s make sure I get the dates right. Um, in 1870, in Spr Scribner's Monthly, there was an article about the wonders of the Yellowstone, so all the geysers and hot pools, um, that was illustrated by Thomas Moran, but he had only descriptions to go on. Uh, so the next year, he came out. A photographer came out and they made uh, both photographs and drawings of the Yellowstone. And then the following year, uh, he came out again and started making paintings. And so, although this is, of course, accurate for the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone, this painting by Thomas Moran, which is a little bit exaggerated, but more or less accurate, became an iconic image at that time. And in fact, sat on an easel in front of Congress as they debated the idea of setting aside this huge corner of Wyoming uh, as a preserve. So they could have put the photograph there, but you know, you know, the photograph didn't have color and it wasn't quite as dramatic as Moran's painting. So as I say, a traditional stage. And uh, in March of 1872, they voted to make Yellowstone our first national park and as this painting stood in front of Congress. It wasn't I think called a national park at the time because the National Park Service wasn't uh, founded until 1916, I think. Um, but it was set aside as a national preserve. It wouldn't have been what we thought of as a national park. Okay, so that's, that's all I'm going to do for history. The next time we pick up on the history thread, we'll talk about photography as the development of photography as an art. Soon there are no questions on that, but I could certainly ask for them. Any questions? Let me check the dory. Interesting going on in the dory. 
Yep. Uh, all right. So let's switch gears. And we'll spend the rest of the time talking about composition. So it's dangerous to propose that I'm going to give a lecture on composition. And I think Ansel Adams puts it as well as anyone. <laughs> there are no rules for good photographs. There are only good photographs. And of course, he's right. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't try to talk about it and at least mention issues. So here's what we'll do. We're going to talk about the pictorial elements of photography. So I think of those as the vocabulary elements. And then we'll talk about pictorial design, which I think of as the sentences or the paragraphs. We're going to be talking only about the 2D pictorial design. So we're not talking about the 3D scene or the mechanics of getting that into the camera, so exposure and focus and so on. We'll talk about that later. And we're not talking about the narrative meaning of the scene either. We're just talking about the design in the frame as you will. So that kind of scopes in uh, today's uh, lecture. So there are no rules, but there are tools. There are heuristics. It's like describing wine. It's subjective, but nevertheless, a wine can be described as fat or flabby or aristocratic or something like that. Vocabularies are developed so that we can at least discuss it and so people can share their opinions about it. And so it's a framework for thinking about the issues. The best way, of course, to learn composition is to take lots of pictures, uh, post them, criticize them, and look at great, photograph great photographs by others. And we'll do a little bit of all of those things to try and uh, attack this issue from multiple sides. OK, so let's uh, get started directly. And we'll talk first about the vocabulary, these pictorial elements. And we'll start with a very simple one, which is lines. So. If you're in art school, they'll often ask, what is your organizing principle? Well, the organizing principle here is clearly lines. Tall, narrow, slightly wobbly lines. But Ansel Adam was clearly thinking about lines when he took this photograph. When I look at this photograph, I almost like want to stand up straighter. So lines are clearly the pictorial element here. But you can use lines in a variety of ways. So here's a different way of using lines. It's more the arrangement of lines than the fact of the line itself that's important. It's a spray of lines. Um, it's symmetrical, both uh, left, right, and m perhaps more importantly, bottom top. It's clearly a reflection in water. But the photographer has been very careful to hide the horizon and to hide any context. And so. The photographer is clearly thinking this is a cool design, just an arrangement of lines. Are you thinking, <laughs> Zalman suggesting that these are rays that are being yeah, traced through? Oh, no, I was thinking of chromosomes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. But, the fact that arrangements of lines in an abstract fashion make you think of other things is fair game for composition and photography, absolutely. Uh, OK, so lines can be used in a variety of different ways. They can also be used as a decorative element on a design that is something different. So this is, of course, the Brooklyn Bridge. And the main element is the tower. But the, this is a fairly common photograph. Lots of people take this photograph because the radial lines, which is somewhat unique, the Brooklyn Bridge has uh, these angular uh, cables as well as the suspension cables. Sorry, I'm, I'm a bridge freak. Uh, draws your attention to the main element. Here's another example of lines that draw your attention to the main element. You kind of follow the line up and, oh, look, there are the flowers there. And this is a fairly common uh, use of lines in photography. This is a very famous example where you kind of just follow the lines around and, and find the one character that adds an accent of interest to the composition. These lines don't need to be smooth. They don't need to be man-made. And so this is from Brian Peterson's book, 
uh, learning to see creatively, and he's clearly showing that the, these lines are leading your interest, your visual uh, attention to the frosted tree at the bottom. So painters have, of course, known this kind of uh, trick for a long time. So this is a, a painting by Raphael, and the cupids are all aiming their arrows at Galatea, and it's clearly drawing your interest to the main character. As well as the, the figures kind of at bottom that sort of encircle her. Another way of using just the compositional elements to draw your attention to the main character. By the way, I was just at the Palace of the Legion of Honor yesterday, and there's a great Raphael that I had never seen before, the Lady with the Unicorn. It's a, it's a beautiful painting. Okay, so taking a little uh, step up the pyramid, if you will, form can be thought of as lines that have some meaning. So this is one of these great illustrations from Brian um, Peterson's book where he says, well, you could have taken this picture, but if you look around carefully, you'll find that within that same field of view is this picture, which is arguably more interesting. So it's lines that have meaning. So I don't know what meaning you attribute to this. To me, this looks like a nude female form. Some, some of you seem to agree. Um, if I haven't convinced you, then maybe this one convinces you more. So this is uh, Edward Weston. But that's almost obviously a man's muscular back, right? That's almost certainly what he had in mind. Now that doesn't convince you. This certainly will convince you. Uh, lines that suggest meaning. So we can take that as far as we want to, but it gets a little dangerous. At some point, we begin to talk about the narrative meaning of the, the picture. Perhaps a better example of a shape that is still just a shape is, of course, this one. But all right, let's back up and continue talking just about the pictorial elements and not the, the meaning of the scene. So pattern is another pictorial element. Um, so this is, again, one of these uh, Brian Peterson where he says, well, you could have taken this picture, but there's something magical going on if you look carefully. Isn't that a great photograph? And it's all about pattern. It's about this repeating elements of these turkey um, wattles, I think they're called, the glowing things on the turkey. They seem to be all talking at once. I think they're probably hot, actually, but uh, maybe someone who knows more about birds than I do. They all look like they're talking at once. Here's another example, the Abenary Stepwell in uh, Rajasthan. It's, uh, this, uh, some of these pictures I took, but I'll try to minimize the number of my own pictures I stick in here. So I took this picture also, thinking of uh, Peterson. I should have put an element of interest in the middle. There should have been a person sitting on one of those steps. There's a flawed, flawed composition in, in my view. This is an example where there's also an accent element. This is a very famous photograph, uh, the Sea of Steps. It's also a good example of viewpoint, although we're not talking about viewpoint today, just getting down and making the steps themselves uh, the dominant element. So, of course, when you're photographing architecture, you can make patterns of lines very easily and make them the dominant element of the scene. You can also make kind of a looser pattern, more of a rhythm, and I think the photographer had that in mind. You look at a picture like this, and you can almost, you can almost put it to music, going from top to bottom. Dum, da, dum, 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 dum. It's sort of a looser form of a pattern. Here's an example from the history of art. So this is a very complex scene that Renoir is painting. And it could have been a very busy scene that didn't seem connected and held together. But he used a very clever patterning element, which was the dappled shadows cast by some kind of canopy uh, that puts dappled shadows on everyone, creates a pattern, and holds the entire composition together. It's a very clever trick, and a beautiful painting, of course. This is a Montmartre in Paris. OK, so texture is another basic pictorial element. 
Um, the use of texture was promoted, although certainly not invented, by the F64 Club in photography. So remember, this is Ansel Adams using very small F, uh, very high F numbers, small apertures, so that he gets uh, high depth of field. But remember, his F64 has a large plate, and so the actual hole is not that small, and so diffraction is, is not that bad. So he's getting a very sharp photograph. Uh, and he's printing it on smooth papers, so it actually helps to go look at Ansel Adams' prints. And you can see the, the very, very fine grain texture. Um, reaction against the pictorialists. So when we cover the history of photography as an art, we'll talk about the pictorialists. They were basically photographic impressionists, coming around the same time as the impressionism in art. And they were making very kind of hazy, ethereal pictures. And this was a reaction against it and said, come on, guys, let's not just copy those French artists. Let's do something unique, powerful, sharp. OK. Uh, Co-founder of the 64, the F64 Club was Edward Weston. I already showed his pepper. This is another one of his famous photographs, the dunes at Oceano, which I think are down near San Luis Obispo. Uh, if you kind of hold your hand over the bottom half of that left picture, it's not nearly as interesting. The texture in the bottom half really makes that picture worth looking at. And uh, the same thing on the right. The texture is an important pictorial element. So just to bring in another art form, architects certainly knew about the proper uses of texture in design. And a great example of that is Frank Lloyd Wright's Falling Water, where it's really all about texture. Uh, the, the rock against the smooth balconies. Uh, it's maybe even more evident if we stand back a little bit and put it in an autumnal scene where the whole, the whole story is about textures of the, the slate and the leaves and the, the, national, the natural rock. And it's continued inside, where the floor uh, has a texture, and the walls have texture, and the ceilings are too low. Frank Lloyd Wright was five feet eight, and he took advantage of that fact. And so I'm not that tall, but I feel like I need to stoop when I go into Frank Lloyd Wright house. OK. So lighting can be an aid to pictorial design, although we're not really talking about lighting. Lighting can bring out lines or bring out patterns. And so you do have to think of lighting while you're trying to invent your pictorial design. Um, I'm only, this is not my favorite example, but I put it in there because it's from uh, London's book. So this is perhaps a more famous example of it. So we'll be showing uh, a number of Joseph Karsh's portraits one of the most famous portrait photographers of the 20th century. There's a great story behind this famous portrait of Churchill. Churchill was smiling, which isn't Churchill. And so at the last minute, Karsh reached over and pulled a cigar out of his mouth. <laughs> this is the prime minister of England. You don't just reach over it. Well, he did. And so <laughs> Churchill kind of pouted at him, click. That was the iconic picture. Sort of like you know, pulling a pacifier out of a baby's <laughs> just before it starts crying. <laughs> okay, so, uh, yeah, oh yes, uh, Zalman saying that uh, pulling a pacifier out of a baby's mouth has been exploited <laughs> photographically. Uh, all right, but look at, let's look at the pictorial composition. So, there are a number of things going on here. First of all, while I'm pointing this out, um, look at the, the face. So there are a number of things that are being done with the face. This is a little bit off topic, but this is a, a, such a great photograph. There's a dominant eye and an undominant eye. That's very strong compositional trick that's used for photography and painting. There's also more light on one side of the face than the other. We'll come back and we'll talk about that later in the in the course when we talk about key versus fill lighting. And the face is slightly turned to the side. All three of those are very common compositional elements for portraits. But the main pictorial composition is there's a triangle here, 
It's he head, hand, hand. Look at this Rembrandt picture. So first, uh, the hands aren't shown here, but look at the, look at the face turn. Look at the dominant eye, non-dominant eye. And look at the key fill. It's exactly the same. It's a v so go out now and look at portraits, paintings or photographs by famous portraitures. You'll typically see this. Having both eyes look the same is a different kind of a picture and has less interest. And here's one that actually shows the, the composition, the same composition. Hand, uh, I'm sorry, head, hand, hand. Really very similar. And in fact, uh, they're almost in the same pose, the, the two hands. Uh, certainly, Josef Karsh would have known about Rembrandt and the way he did portraits. Certainly. All right, here we're beginning to try to stretch things a little bit, but I think it's worth doing. Let's talk about tone as a pictorial element. And the greatest uh, example I can think of is uh, Maplethorpe who uh, used tone in order to arrange the elements on the canvas. And he's thinking very much about the two-dimensional design as well as about the objects themselves. For example, if there were not this gradient in the background from top to bottom, you wouldn't be able to see the flowers or the vase. It had to be dark at the top and light at the bottom. This is basically a study in tone. It's a nude, but it's also really a study in tone, the sheen on her skin. And this is perhaps my favorite example. He's thinking about a pictorial design that is light on the left, medium shade in the middle, and dark on the right, as well as being a particular symmetrical arrangement of lines. Yeah, sure, these are new men and women, but it's a pictorial design. And in fact, he's drawing your attention to the fact that it is a design by cutting off their heads. We can also use color as a pictorial element. So I don't mean color being used to set a mood, the warm mood of the one on the top or the cool mood of, of the one on the bottom, but actually being used as in the two-dimensional pictorial design. So here's color being used as an accent in what's otherwise a uh, silhouette. This is an easy trick to do. and makes a very interesting photograph. So you should go out and play with that. Here's another example where most of the colors are sort of earth tones, except for this splash of very bright color. And so color is being used as an accent. There are lots of different ways you can use color as a pictorial element. Um, this is a portrait, and it's kind of encircled by color but there's less color in the middle. And certainly the patterns and the, the color circling it is, is part of it. Is this a boy or a girl? I've never figured that out. Boy? Woman. woman. Yeah, woman. Okay. Not sure. Look at this Renaissance painting. So uh, the Virgin typically is wearing um, lapis lazuli ultramarine. Uh, as a matter of fact, there would typically be two contracts for a Renaissance painting, one for the, the art of the artist, and the second for the amount of lapis lazuli that the artist had to buy in order to make the ultramarine for the virgin's cloak, if there was a virgin, because it was very expensive. But look at the way color is being used. So she's got this bright blue cloak on, but then there are all these accents of red that kind of encircle her. Orange, orange, deeper red, orange, a bright red. So it's, it's a circle of reds around a blue central element. And certainly Bellini would have been thinking about that arrangement of colors. In fact, he has a whole sequence of altarpieces. And in that sequence, you could see him gradually refining his pictorial design, his pictorial use of color in this case, to, to sort of frame and draw your attention to the middle. You can use color as a rhythmic accent. Um, this is an illustration from Hedgeco's book on photography. It's more or less a monochrome uh, image, but there are little accents of orange here. Maybe that one there, too. This has a long history in art as well. 
So this is Peter Paul Rubens. Uh, the Judgment of Paris. So what is it? It's Aphrodite. Help me out here. Thera. Who's the third one? Ah, I'm going to have to look. Athena. Athena. And being judged by Paris. And uh, Paris eventually chose Aphrodite, who is on the left, uh, because she promised him... That these are gods, so he's not interested in them, goddesses. But she promised him Helen of Sparta, which led to the Trojan War. But look at the use of color. So it's a sequence of... Look at the cloak there, and the dark cloak here, and his. And then there's sort of a a tension being created by blues and reds, uh, sorry, blues and purples. That there and this there to kind of give some dynamic tension to the whole composition. Clearly, Peter Paul Rubens was thinking, well, what am I going to do with color in this scene? It's mostly a bunch of flesh pots, but there should be uh, an interesting color design. Here's a more subtle use of color as a rhythmic element. So this is a very famous painting by Velasquez, and it's basically a painting in tone, in monochrome tone. But he does put accents of red, the flowers that they're wearing, all across it to create some interest. All right. So that's um, kind of a quick run through of pictorial elements. But I never really talked, except in the Joseph Karsh portrait of uh, uh, Winston Churchill, about how they're arranged and what the common arrangements are. So let's now take a step up and talk about the sentence that these vocabulary elements are combined into and talk about pictorial design. So there could be a longer list here, but I want to give you a few possible designs so that you can think about them as you take photographs. Uh, so I promise not too many of my own photographs, but I do have just a, a couple in here. Symmetry is, of course, an easy one. If you're doing architectural photography, it's kind of easy to get uh, rattled into uh, symmetry. Uh, I think I've seen so many pictures of this arcade in Redfort in New Delhi that look exactly like this. Uh, this is from um, a carousel in Place La Carousel in Paris. So symmetry. But asymmetry is the right solution for many photographs that you would take. So Montmartre, as seen from another part of Paris is not symmetrical, and you should take advantage of that. You should actually place the whole Montmartre off-center to accentuate the asymmetry of the architecture. And the same thing uh, near the Amber Fort in Rajasthan. It's the same kind of deliberately asymmetrical design. All right, enough of my own pictures. So this is a more subtle use of asymmetry. There is an arcade of two doors that is making a symmetrical, regular design. And then there's this diagonal of the women going into church that make a counterpoint to it. You're kind of looking at me like, what is he talking about? <laughs> Bear with me for a second. If you don't believe me on that photograph, let me go to an example from art that I think more clearly does the same thing. David's famous portrait of the Oath of the Horatii. So... Uh, the story, by the way, is the father is asking his three sons to swear on their swords that they will defend Rome during the Republic. The women are mourning because one of them is a sister of one of the sons, but is married to a Horatii, the enemy. And the other one is married to one of the sons and is a sister of the Horatii. Okay, but let's look at the pictorial composition. So, David is uh, uh, one of the neoclassicists uh, around the time of Napoleon, and so they're beginning to try to introduce these organizing elements along with the drama. The arch in the back is clearly a symmetrical organizing theme into which he's put these dramatic elements. He's got the suns under one arch, the the father under the second arch, and the, the grieving women on the third. So it helps to organize what would otherwise be a fairly chaotic scene. Have I convinced you at all? Maybe a few more of you are saying, oh, maybe he's not completely crazy. 
the color in this shot. Yes, yeah. The um, the fact that they that he's choosing women who are wearing something that uh, that relates to the color of the Baptist Church. Absolutely, that is true. Okay. So let's talk about framing, which is the use of pictorial elements and how you make a frame for the scene. So you can do symmetrical, but uh, this is uh, probably a more interesting framing, is to bring in foreground elements uh, and take it off center. So here's a much more dramatic framing. So this is James Dean, Rebel Without a Cause. And I guess the staircase on the left and his own shadow and the shadow of the staircase on the right are making a dramatic diagonal tense frame around this troubled youth. I would not want this picture on my bedroom wall. I would not get much sleep. But that's a deliberate and clever use of the framing. So the picture frame itself also is a frame and can be used creatively. So this is another of Brian Peterson's pictures where he says, well, yeah, you could have taken this picture, but suppose you just did this. Some of you did this, I know, on your bad photographs, but um, deliberately, and made some of them quite interesting. Brian Peterson is saying that the picture frame itself, deliber which deliberately frames the whole picture in a different way, makes this a much more dramatic picture. What is that? What is that? Yeah, I think we're looking down at a man that is um, climbing out of a spillway for a dam, and so the flume beneath him is all the water coming out. I believe that's what this is. You can kind of see there's a little staircase that he's uh, climbing out of. He's debugging a flume job. He's debugging a, a flume job. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> I don't know how to continue from that. The joke wouldn't work at Stanford. Right? <laughs> no, that's right. We're getting a whole different... Uh... All right. So... Another Raphael painting showing framing. So architecture can be used for framing. This is a whole bunch of philosophers, the School of Athens, and it would be a chaotic picture if it weren't for that frame. So the frame in this case is an arch from the Basilica of St. Peter's as it was in Raphael's time, partially incomplete, and you can see the sky through it. So it's not a ruin, it's not fanciful. That's actually what St. Peter's Basilica looked like at the time that Raphael made this painting. There's another interesting thing about this painting. Uh, there are groups of philosophers. There's um, Aristotle and, uh, which one is which? Plato on the left, Aristotle on the right. Uh, Socrates is, I think, over here. So that's the master, and then Plato was his student, and then Aristotle was his student. Um, this is a huge painting. It covers an entire wall. And so one of the struggles you would have is if you were to stand too close to this thing or go up and examine the individual artists, or the individual philosophers, like the pictures from the Nexus 6P, they would be rather distorted, as we talked about with those columns in the first lecture. So what Raphael does is he says, never mind that, we're not going to create a single proper linear perspective. I'll create a proper linear perspective for the architecture so it doesn't look terrible. But for each group of philosophers, I'll, I will create a local frame of reference and a local perspective so that when you go up and you examine, um, I think this is Ptolemy holding the sphere, it looks okay locally. And indeed, notice that that is a circular sphere. If this wide angle perspective were a single consistent linear perspective, that would be an ellipsoid, be very distorted. And so he's making these local perspective views. Now, this is not something you can do in photography unless you compose a picture from many sub-pictures than you could. Um, same thing here. The groups of philosophers in their, own, uh, in, in their own frame of reference. Let's see. So uh, he was halfway through this painting, and he was getting to know Michelangelo a little bit better. At the same time, Michelangelo was painting... I think the far wall of the Sistine Chapel, right next door, because they were uh, in the Vatican. And he just, Michelangelo was not very googly. And he finally just put Michelangelo in his own painting. As uh, 
what's it, Demoth's? Um, there's a, a recluse philosopher, Demoth's of Zine or something like that. I, I don't quite get the name right. Um, because he just, he just couldn't figure out this guy. All right, so uh, let's go to photography. Uh, this is Josef Karsh again, and it's a fantastic portrait of the, the painter, uh, the uh, sculptor Giacometti, who really seems to be haunted and trapped by his own art. And if you know about Giacometti's life, that is sort of the story of his life. And I think that's so well captured by the way he frames Giacometti's face. It's almost like Giacometti is looking out through prison bars. It's a very clever pictorial design. So here's another Josef Karsh, Karsh portrait. Think about the relationship of your subject to the frame and how much space is around it. Now that's a pictorial design uh, consideration. Clark Gable is charismatic. He's a larger than life figure. And so Josef Karsh gave almost no space around the figure. Goes right up to the edges of the frame. Looks like he's about to completely burst out of that frame. That's what Clark Gable was like. And Josef Karsh is capturing that. You can do something opposite. You can have something floating in space. And that gives a different emotive uh, meaning. It's something the surrealists did, like uh, Magritte. Or this photograph, that's a photograph by Bernard uh, Balsan. By having one element floating, it gives this sort of surrealistic or mystical quality to it. And so think about the space versus the elements in your pictorial design, and you can play with the, the same emotions. All right, let's get a little bit more specific and talk about uh, the actual arrangement of elements, uh, not just the amount of space or the kind of framing or something like that. Uh, and I'll just consider a few common designs of these pictorial elements. This list could go on forever. Okay, so upright equilateral triangle been used since time immemorial. Renaissance painting is full of it, another Raphael, and it's got a triangle with uh, uh, Jesus, St. John the Baptist, and, uh, the, and uh, the Madonna. What's the pictorial design on the right? It's a much more daring picture. It's not this static triangle which was common at the time then in Renaissance art. Some kind of diagonal, maybe? It's a very unusual composition because uh, it is, uh, I guess, a, a nobleman uh, who just won a battle, and he's asking St. Peter to write his name in the good book uh, with the Madonna looking on approvingly. So if you make a diagonal slash like that through your picture, you better balance it in some way. You see what the balancing elements are here? How about that? Done with color as well, but those two red elements. I think the artist is in there somewhere. Very typical conceit for Renaissance art. Uh, okay, so uh, I'll show one more example from painting. This is, T Titian is hard to understand. His compositions are fairly subtle, but this is, again, a diagonal. And then he has to balance the diagonal. So he'll have accents of red across the diagonal. He'll do even more subtle things like that. The hair, her hair sort of a brown, and the dog, which is a common art element called, whoops, sorry. Called a pendant. It's a hanging thing that is just supposed to balance something else. Poor dog. Okay, so we can find the same things in photography. So photographers are doing that. This is perhaps the most famous nude photograph. It's Edward Weston of his model, then mistress, then wife, uh, uh, Cherise Wilson. See the triangle? I don't even need to draw that on top. It's fairly obvious. 
Um, this is a picture from a photographic composition. It's got a, a competition. It's got a lot of these same elements. You can see rule of thirds and a diagonal. The fact that her back is hunched like that kind of leads you toward her eye. The framing around her eye is another, it's a use of lines that also accentuates her eye. This has got a bunch of interesting compositional elements in this design. S-curves are very common. I don't know what it is about S-curves, whether they are some deep-seated evolutionary adaptation that we like S-curves, um, but it is a powerful design uh, for pictures. These all have S-curves. There's a great collection of articles about photographic composition. So I'm just kind of scraping off the top here, giving you some, uh, some of these ideas. Ansel Adams used it all the time, of course. So S-curves, that's one of the things that makes this photograph so powerful. It's got this strong S-curve in it. So let me ask, uh, this church is famous for a reason that I'll show in a second. Uh, Ansel Adams took a picture of it. But before I show you Ansel Adams' picture, let's look at a few other people who tried to try their uh, luck at making a dramatic picture. Tell me which one of these you like the best. No correct answer here. Three different pictures of the same church in Bodega. So let's take a vote. Who likes the upper left picture the best? Just raise your hand. Okay. Who likes the middle picture the best? Okay. And who likes the lower right picture the best? Interesting. Okay, um, so kind of lines leading yourself to the composition here. Maybe this one's interesting because it's very, very straight lines. Someone want to take a step? Why do they like the middle one? Someone raise their hand for the middle one. What is it about the composition there that you like so much? Build the frame more and it's framed by the trees. Framed by the trees. Oh, right. Yeah. There's nice framing from the trees, which the others don't have. I'm not sure if it's just like the lower resolution of the picture, but it, um, the way the lighting is on the building, it makes it almost like a bigger than it really is. Uh, it, it looks a little, uh, I hope that it's not too low res picture that I had up res for this. But it, you're right, it does seem almost a little gauzy or hazy. Uh, I just hope that's not an artifact of the way I made it. It, it is a little bit soft. Yeah, uh, I just hope it's not an artifact of my own slide. So here's Ansel Adams' picture. He's clearly thinking about 2D pictorial design. Yeah, sure, he's using the rule of thirds, but the whole church is in the upper third. And he's got a road strongly leading to it um, as, the, as a dominant linear element at the bottom. It's a very interesting design. So the, this church is famous, of course, because this is where Hitchcock filmed the birds. And you can see the church in the background. All right, let me end with a set of slides that I have stolen from uh, Fredo Durand, um, my compatriot at MIT, uh, and added a few pictures too. And he talks about composition in one of his courses and gives kind of rules of thumb, simple rules to avoid compositional errors. And I think it's a great set of slides. So let me show it with a, a few of my own additions. So simplify the picture. These are cluttered pictures. Look for a simple pictorial design. And there are a variety of photographic tools you can use to do that, one of which is depth of field to avoid a cluttered background. That's harder with a cell phone, of course at least cell phones as they currently stand. <laughs> so sports photographers, uh, you, we'll use that all the time. I'll give a lecture a little bit later in the course on sports photography. It's also helpful to sports too, because then your threes and are more of an aperture that you get more light from too, right? So then you can do a faster start. Right, uh, he's pointing out um, that you use a larger aperture for sports, typically, so that you can use a shorter shutter speed, and that gives you a shallower depth of field. 
I forgot that I haven't been checking the Dory, so let me see if there's anything on the Dory. That's, that's absolutely true. No. Uh, be careful of distracting elements. You can fix it. This one is fixed in Photoshop. Be better if you just moved a little bit and, and you could hide whatever that is that's behind him. So avoid unnecessary, or leave them there because maybe they're an interesting element. This is from the 2008 election. Hillary's running uh, for nomination and someone in the back has a different opinion. <laughs> interesting picture to look at nowadays. What's that? It looks like she's guest starring in Seinfeld or something. Guest starring in Seinfeld. <laughs> okay. Okay. Another Brian Peterson. He says, well, you could take the picture in the upper left, but that's kind of cluttered. But there's this amazing pictorial design if you zoom in. And his book has several examples of that. You could take the picture on the left, but look at that amazing pictorial design that's sitting waiting for you on the right if you just look for the details. Uh, avoid compositional errors. So don't center something needlessly. Remember the rule of thirds. It tends to look better for human observers if you put it on one of those third lines, and this is an example of that. Give the, the picture space to breathe on another side. Uh, also, if you're taking a picture of a person and they're looking toward the side, or an animal looking toward the side, always give them room on that side. And that's an example of that. Uh, be careful of your horizon. Uh, make it wildly unlevel or make it level, but don't make it nearly level. Uh, of course, careful of things sticking out of people's heads, which you can fix just by moving the camera a little bit. Avoid accidental alignments. And uh, a great piece of advice from Fredo is check the frame for trouble before you take a picture. And you can see here, slightly cropped. You're missing just a little bit of the bird. I don't think the bird would be very happy if it were missing the front of its toes. Um, there's a bit of a distracting element here. And this is not quite horizontal, but it's almost horizontal. So check all the way around the picture for problems <coughs> before you take the picture. Fredo's a great photographer. He also teaches computational photography, does research on computational photography, and I uh, just love looking at his pictures. Wrong white balance would be my guess, deliberately. There are also uh, a number of, uh, this is from my Stanford slide set, there are a number of uh, uh, professors at Stanford that are superb photographers. Matthew Scott is uh, in developmental biology, but he goes out into the Baylands where I commute by bicycle every day and just takes these amazing pictures. Or Susan McConnell, those are at Anna Nuevo. I think that season of sex and violence is over now at Anna Nuevo. All right, so uh, that's it for composition. We'll continue with uh, autofocus and metering on Wednesday.